during the next few even songs for this uh, fall season, I'm going to take the opportunity to offer a series of uh, short addresses or presentations on the origins of Christian worship. I'll be drawing uh, on a lecture given by Father Thomas Hopko at Wheaton College's Center for Early Christian Studies called From Shadow to Reality, Ancient Christian Worship. The foundations of Christian worship were established by around the 8th century through the 7th Ecumenical Council. Tonight I'm going to begin with the very foundational theme of the early church, which we call the eschatological, a chewy word that I mentioned this, in this morning's uh, homily. At its core, the early church's worship is based on the scriptures. It's an ancient unfolding of tradition from our Jewish, our Hebrew uh, ancestors, the law, the Psalms, and the prophets of the Old Testament. The worship in the Torah, the Psalter, the prophets is messianic, meaning it is about believing in the one God, Yahweh, the Lord Elohim, the coming of the Messiah. So what happens then when the future anticipation is fulfilled. Christian worship is this continuation of worship in the age of fulfillment. It's an unbroken stream. For the Christian, especially the early Christian, the Old Testament, what we call, which would have been for them the only scriptures there were until around the third or fourth century, is a prefiguration that is fulfilled in Christ. After the destruction of the temple in around 70 AD, the scattered Jewish diaspora were in a new world of discovery on how to be a faithful Jew without a temple. How do we offer sacrifice? The first Jewish Christians were just one of many sects who were forging the answer to this very question. The Christian Jew believed that the Messiah had indeed come, that the Old Testament was, was fulfilled. The new age had dawned in Jesus Christ. There was no more temple. The sacrifice was God himself given in Jesus Christ. And our offering of sacrifice became, of course, the Eucharist. This theme richly illuminates, for example, the Gospel of John. Or if you want to read uh, the uh, letter to the Hebrews is another fine example of, of this work. Or, or Revelation, the ap ap apocalyptic genre of writing of John. The Christian church understood itself to be the Israel of God. You have a new covenant, you have a new earth, a new creation, the new human, but there's no new Israel. There's only one Israel of God, and Jesus is the Messiah who exists for the sake of the salvation of the whole creation. This christening, as it were, of the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament developed into what we call eschatology. The eschaton is the end times, the fulfillment of the ages. And for many, including Paul, when you read uh, his early letters, it would seem that everyone thought the end was imminent any moment now. But eventually, as people started dying and so on, and Jesus had not uh, uh, descended, the second coming of Christ was developed in a more philosophical understanding. And our theology developed the idea of the sacramental experience of the end time, the fulfillment of the kingdom now in Christ Jesus in the Eucharist. Fulfilled now, but also not yet. As I was sharing with you this morning, we humans participate in a linear experience of history, always future-oriented. 
to this ultimate fulfillment where the communion of saints exists already. But we get a taste of the fullness of this realized reality when God breaks into time in the sacraments. This is the way that the Eucharist was understood. What we are saying amen to when we gather at this table. The Eucharist is not about bread and wine. It's about us. The body realizing the fullness of the divine reality here and now. We'll get to that at another talk. The Gospels themselves, like the one we heard today, were typological continuations of scriptural accounts. When we say typological, we mean the images of the Old, Te Old Testament were uh, typologies. So Moses would be a Christ typology, for example. Remembering that, of course, the Gospels are not considered Scripture until the Council of Nicaea in the 4th century. For example, Jesus' meeting of the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well in John 4 is reminiscent of the Old Testament types, such as Isaac meeting his bride at a well, as well as Jacob and Rachel, Moses and Zephora. For a Johannine interpretation, Jesus is the divine bridegroom, He's actually meeting his bride at the well in Samaria. And who is his bride? Well, his bride is the sinful, fallen, corrupted world. Remember, a Samaritan woman on her fifth husband, and she's a heretic, and as far as a Jew is concerned, a dog. The age has been fulfilled in Christ. Where should we worship, she asks him. And he replies, The hour is coming and is when neither on Gerizim nor in Jerusalem will the worship be, but it will be the worship of spirit and truth, for such the Father seeks to worship him. Christian worship, then, as the fulfillment of the law and the Psalms and the prophets, is in fact the worship in the spirit, in truth, that God the Father desires for all his people. And that is what people do when we worship. We're worshiping on behalf of all people and on behalf of all creation as the bride with Christ. The first sermon ever preached in the history of Christianity, we can hear in the Acts of the Apostles on the day of Pentecost, Peter goes out into the street. This Jesus that you killed... God raised this Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Now he is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven, at God's right hand. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. And then a voice from the crowd says to him, cries out, What then shall we do? We blew it. Believe. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus, and you will receive the Spirit of God. In other words, change your whole way of looking at reality. Trust in the gospel. Be baptized, which means to die with him, to be co-crucified with him, and to be raised and to live by the Spirit of God alone. To live in Christ is to live in the Spirit of God. In fact, it is to share in the immortal life, literally, as we hear in Second Peter, to be partakers of the divine nature. The first early Christian creed was God became human that human would become God. Worship is always worshiping in the Spirit, yielding to the presence of Christ, Worship is a participation in God's life. And finally, it continues, And those who believed and were baptized, it said, they continued steadfastly in, and he names four things, they continued steadfasting, steadfastly in the teaching of the apostles, he dedicated on apostolon, 
They continued steadfastly in the communion, koinonia. They continued steadfastly in the klesis to artu, the breaking of the bread, and in the prayers. Notice these definite articles, the teaching of the apostles, the communion. The church is the communion within the communion of the Trinity itself. You may notice that uh, in the mornings when I, uh, or often when I pray the grace at a sacramental liturgy, I'll say the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit, which often is uh, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, but the communion of the Holy Spirit is a far better translation of koinonia because that names the, what the Holy Spirit is doing in knitting us together as Christ's body here on the earth. The liturgy of the church, this word liturgia, means a common act, a common act of all the believers together. It's an act of the church itself, the kahal, Israel, the new or the continuation of Israel. And in the Old Testament, the kahal was not the assembly of God unless the Lord himself was there, present and governing and presiding over the assembly. And so for the early fledgling church, Jesus is known in the breaking of the bread. And he shows how the law, the Psalms, and the prophets are all about him. And this is the worship in spirit and in truth that the world has been waiting for in the Messiah. When the end of the age has come upon us, which it has since Jesus is crucified and the spirit is poured out. And which is also witnessed to in the first sermon ever preached in Christian history by the Apostle Peter on the streets of Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. So today, friends, we heard in the Gospel, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Strive first for the kingdom of God, and all these things will be given unto you. Our worship as Christians from its inception is always standing at the cross, acknowledging the freedom gifted to us in the, in the cross of Jesus, the gift of true freedom, which is the crown of our being made in the image and likeness of God. And using this freedom in our worship, in surrendering ourselves with Christ in the Spirit to God. In baptism and in Eucharist, Indeed, all over our life is a handing over of ourselves to the one who loved us first.